When we replaced the old high school, we knew that that was just the beginning. And it would be a window of opportunity that we couldn't pass up. And we wanted to finish the rest of the school district, but that would have been impossible at the time. So we started our work. Uh, all that planning had to go in. Another window of opportunity came up. We took advantage of that window. We had the election in 2016, and we passed with flying colors, which was great. We, we are official. With 85% of the vote in, one, I'm sorry, 10,242 for, 7,940 against. Uh, the big deal on that one is the state this time would pay two-thirds of the cost, and we would only have to pay one-third. On our high school issue, I believe we were saying to people it was 40% off. So our percentage went down, the state's percentage went up, and we thought this was the time to do the whole district. So we put in a plan at that point to build five schools. Uh, they would be uh, of different types. Uh, two of the schools would be K-4, uh, two of the schools would be K-8, and one of the schools would be pre-K-8. We also wanted to replace the stadium at the same time. The state, of course, doesn't pay for stadiums. So when we had the bond issue, we had to have an amount that was around $120 million for the five schools, but we had to add an LFI, local funded initiative. And one of the things I'll never forget um, was when we built the new high school, my daughter played volleyball. We were there um, at the new high school and running into a number of parents from other schools um, just complimenting us about what a great school, great gymnasium, how beautiful it was, your kids deserve this. And all they could talk about was, what are you going to do with that stadium? Uh, people loved O'Leary High School and the way it looked and they comment over and over how it looks like a campus. And we wanted to carry that theme over into those five buildings. Of course, the stadium had nothing to do with those buildings. It was just an old stadium that needed to be replaced. And anybody that used that old stadium, uh, particularly uh, anybody that had to use the restroom in the old stadium, don't have very fond memories of what that was like and everything needed to go there. There was nothing that could be salvaged. It all had to be replaced. Um, so we did incorporate a new stadium and uh, that was not funded at all by the state, funded by the taxpayers. And we put the new stadium in, um, the baseball fields. As a matter of fact, the new project's going to be to move over the softball field have everything there as one campus, and we're gonna get new lighting, um, we're gonna have new uh, parking, we're gonna tie it all together with a new uh, center um, restroom and concession stand and girls softball, and should be the final touches on it. Just very excited for the community to have this one sports complex for, for all of us. You know, you've got the football field and you've got the practice fields, and now you're doing the work on the baseball and softball fields. You have the tennis courts. Um, just the events that can be held there um, just makes the, makes the complex so much more useful. Um, and, but I do talk to people from other cities that talk about our sports complex. And, and a lot of those cities already had a sports complex. Now Elyria is a part of that fraternity, if you will. And now there is other places. I mean, look what Elyria Catholic just recently did at their sports field. Um, and I think that's just driven everything around our community, but I hear a lot of people talk about our sports complex, as well as our school buildings. What we do is when a district is uh, sort of on our radar uh, of getting funded, uh, we'll contact the district and let them know that, and so we can begin the planning process. We always look at the, the district as a whole. We never just look at parts and pieces. We're, we're concerned about stepping back and first of all, creating what we call an overall master plan. So we're, we're taking this uh, big vision step where we're looking at all of the students so that you know we're gonna do a 10-year enrollment projection to see what's going on with students in terms of growth and then we're also looking at the condition of all the existing buildings. So we send a team out to assess all the buildings 
So those are the two main data points, is what is the condition of the buildings and what are the number of students that we're trying to house, uh, not only now, but into the future. We're part of the team that helps develop the project from the ground up. So uh, in this case, Leary went through a planning process, they passed a bond issue and they got ready to go. Uh, and then they went out and selected their team. So they selected their architects. And uh, the way the state's process works is they like the project delivery method of construction management at risk. So uh, we were the construction management team. I would say the team was very collaborative um, and the core team consists of representatives from the district, uh, from OFCC, the uh, architectural team, the construction manager team, and the commissioning agent team. So this whole group meets constantly. Um, and we were really meeting twice a month and then other progress meetings in between to keep our uh, finger on the pulse. You know, architects are used to sort of designing things and seeing a finished product. But when you're doing master plan, it's more of a, a big uh, a big vision rather than, you know, individual buildings. So we look at, you know, how are students learning today? What is some of the research that we know that works best for them? And it's moved away from what we call um, bells and cells, which is where you have very singular classrooms and you hear a bell when you move from your classroom to more um, open, collaborative, maybe some would say organic sort of teaching styles, things that just keep students engaged in different ways um, and teach them in different ways than you could do in a traditional classroom layout. Me being here almost 22 years, I know when I first started, um, you know, districts really, really weren't talking about the things that we're talking about now. You know, people just we're creating new schools that were just sort of a new version of the old, uh, looked nicer on the outside and the inside and had brighter lighting. But if you looked at the sort of the, the general party of the school, it was the same where you'd walk down corridors and classrooms would be on, the both, on both sides. People were realizing that we were focusing too much on, on, the, um, on the teaching and not enough on, on the learning. Um, and so, you know, we, we call these schools now student-centered learning environments or high-performance learning environments because we're focusing more on the student. So, indeed, we've seen over the last few years, uh, rather than it be the exception, it's really becoming more the norm where school districts are seeing the value of designing schools that, uh, you know, have that characteristic. And one of them is, is that they are more flexible because it's allowing students to have more varied experiences. A lot of these spaces we designed to be flexible and then a lot of them became more flexible as you know teachers and students really got in there and started to use the space. Um, one of those spaces is what we call the gathering stair. Um, so every campus school that has a middle school entrance has this large gathering stair where it's a normal stair on one side and then large seats on the other with a larger landing zone in the middle. There's um, ELAs, which in architecture term is extended learning area, but those are um, spaces where we've taken a regular corridor like you would have in a traditional method, and we've sort of opened it up and built the rooms around it rather than um, busting a corridor through rooms in that sense. And with that then, the classrooms can sort of flow out into it and that can be a space that extends their classroom. Um, with the classrooms themselves, there's also a flexible teaching wall in some of them in each of the classrooms, which is a um, divider wall that can come back and the classrooms can join together within that classroom and have a co-teaching moment. And then we have these pods, what we call them, which is where the grades are and their ELA and some of them um, contain two different grade levels or um, maybe separated and have you know four different grade levels some of them you have first and second and third and fourth um, and there's a good separation between there for student safety but it also allows the proximity for there to be older to younger student mentorship each grade level has their own color um, or like I said with first and second third and fourth first and second share color third and fourth do similar to that so each pod 
or grade level has a color and that's consistent through every one of the schools that we've done here in Elyria. So that if a student you know, goes to elementary school in one school and then goes to a campus school, they know the color scheme is the same. They know how to do that. And in this district, we really wanted everything to sort of look back at, you know, maybe say the high school, which is something recently done that's sort of a very cornerstone hallmark of the city of Elyria. And we wanted to echo that, but maybe not exactly copy it. So each of these buildings are, are individual and unique, but they all talk to each other. They all have that Elyria City Schools look to them. Um, and with that, the use of brick in this sort of like urban environment was really appropriate. Um, you have brick streets, you have houses and buildings around that use that. Um, and it's something that can weather and stand time really well as well. So it's durable. It'll be there as long as these surrounding buildings are there as well. Um, so those were all sort of things that we wanted to look into. And then with the metal panel, it gives it a sort of modern look and also can take it from maybe something more municipal with just a masonry building into something that you can be a little playful with and it says you know kids learn here this is a fun space this isn't just like a big solid building it's we have color on the outside we have panel we have lighting it's fun. We were the construction management team so our job during the design portion is to make sure that first of all we're staying on track uh, with the schedule and getting the design done on time uh, so that the construction can happen appropriately, uh, but also keeping track of the cost to make sure that we're not going to uh, exceed our budget at the end of the day and we can get the whole program done. We're setting our budgets at a time well before the projects are actually bid. So we're, we're, we're always trying to anticipate what the market does. In this particular instance, uh, the market didn't go in the direction that it did us any favors. We were barely underway when it started to occur to us that maybe with it being good times, wasn't so good after all for us. It was very difficult to predict back then what was going to happen in the market. Uh, just in school construction alone uh, in, in Northern Ohio, uh, we had a billion dollars worth of K-12 construction uh, hit, the, hit the street at, at basically the same time. It, it, that was unprecedented to see that much work uh, come out all at once. Uh, and that wasn't the only thing that was going on. Of course, you know, we had our major health care systems that were expanding rapidly. Uh, so we, there was a lot of big projects going on and it, re it really uh, took a big chunk out of the available workforce. Uh, and then things both globally and nationally were affecting uh, material prices. So as, as construction boomed in other places, uh, materials became more scarce, those prices started to rise. So uh, what we were experiencing across the board in the state, because we were involved with probably half of that billion dollars worth of construction is we were seeing you know prices from 12 to 15 percent over the available dollars were where they were coming in and and so it, it presented some real challenges for for delivering these these projects uh, within the budget by the time we sold the bonds and got the drawings for all the buildings the market changed dramatically and prices were increasing by 20% in some areas. So the state only had X amount of dollars for us. We had the remaining 33% plus the money we had for locally funded initiatives. So the upgrades in certain areas, but when the prices went so high, the cost of building just went out of this world. We had to use some of that locally funded initiative dollars to fund just the basic project. The one thing we knew we had to do was to work with the money that we had. We knew we could not go back to the community. That would not be right, that would not be fair. They had an understanding that they were going to get five buildings in a stadium. And we had to find then solutions 
that we're going to stay within the parameters of not asking the state for more money because it is what it is. When they gave us our contract and they gave us our amount, that was a fixed amount. And we believe the community might have thought that they weren't getting what they were promised if we didn't do what we said we were going to do. So we had to go to work right away to come up with a plan. We did come up with a plan. It didn't go very far, but we came up with a plan. And the state wanted us to do this because they were, they were getting nervous, I think. At this point, they didn't want to be blamed for not funding the program. And we weren't blaming them. There, there's no fault in this. This was a set of circumstances that uh, the perfect storm, no pun intended, with the storms that were going on and all the construction that was going on, they couldn't have foreseen this. The state has made their commitment and it cannot go any higher. And that left us $7 million short at that point. Mr. Riga, yes. Just, just so we're clear, $3.2 million shortfall. Yes. And that's after you've already after cut. After the $10 million. After you've already cut. $10 right. Okay. After the $10 million. And so we thought that we could get the same amount of teaching space by reducing the buildings from five buildings to three buildings. And instead of having the two smaller buildings that were K-4, we would build three of them that were K-8. And one of the buildings would have been pre-K-8 and we took that to the board. That didn't go well. Well, we were stunned and a lot of information. That was on a Saturday morning in open session and by Wednesday board meeting, um, March of uh, 2018, uh, we had hundreds of people come to us in open session and tell us no. Um, they were very adamant about wanting the five schools and um, the community came out, spoke, and the board decided that there's no way we could cut these schools. So we compelled the committee and the administration to go back, um, and I even made this comment, leaving no stone unturned to find the dollars, to collaborate, uh, but it was a huge concern because of the construction costs, and we knew that we had to meet the commitment that we made to the residents. If that meant you know, cutting something else out, um, within the school, some of the stuff we really wanted but weren't necessary, then that's what we were going to have to do. So I talked to Paul, uh, Mr. Rigda, our consultant that was leading the core team for us for the Board of Education, and we discussed what the options were. And um, I feel a little bad, but uh, I told Paul we had to get it done. Bless the board. They, they were firm, very firm. And that's not what we offered the community. We have to give the people what we said we were going to give the people. And we said, well, we don't have enough money. And they said, that's not their problem. That's your problem. And they sent us on a mission to be as creative as we could. Uh, Mr. Brubaker at the time was the president of the Board of Education. And I distinctly remember him looking right at me and he said, Paul, leave no stone unturned, but you got to make this happen. I think we need to work together to try to find a way to make this happen. I'm committed to doing that. I, first of all, I want to say that as I'm sitting here, the first thing that comes to mind is it's better not to make a vow than to make one and break it. And I am pledging to you tonight that we will do what it takes to get the job done and the job done right. So we had to go back and get very creative. It was tough for the core team to get their arms around, how are we gonna get this done without any more money? And without it looking like we made too many reductions. We have a great euphemistic term for reducing the model and the, reducing the shape. We call it value engineering. It sounds nicer that you're cutting back, but essentially you're cutting back. And we had to do value engineering. But we did value engineering as a team. We want to deliver the best possible product for the lowest responsible cost. The reality is, is that there, there is a sweet spot that you can find throughout these buildings with, with every element that's in it uh, to deliver it the best way possible. And it starts with a really, really basic 
programmatic things on the building. Uh, is it going to be a steel frame structure or is it going to be masonry bearing? Uh, are we, if, if it's multi-story, are we going to use uh, bar joists or composite deck or are we going to use precast uh, for the upper floors? But it takes place through every element on the project, so you have to consider what's the best heating, ventilation, and, and air conditioning system. Uh, you know, what, what kind of lighting and lighting controls, what's the building automation system. So all those things are explored together in a collaborative manner with the architect so that we find uh, the best possible solution. And not only for that initial cost, but also for what the cost is going to be down the road to maintain the building. So part of the process of value engineering is looking at what we call life cycle cost which is what the cost is of that product over its entire intended lifespan. We had to get way out of the box. And we went to the state, not to ask them for more money, but to ask them to give us freedom with the money they gave us so that we could reallocate those resources to the construction. And to show them good faith on our part, part of that LFI money, local funded initiative money, that was going to go into the extras we would make a commitment to the basic construction as well. In other words, we would be adding to the construction costs rather than all add-ons in terms of what we were trying to get done. On the other hand, their part would be to allow us not to abate and demolish nine of the buildings that were scheduled and to turn them over to us. And ordinarily, if we don't abate and demo, then they take their portion, which is two thirds of the cost, back to Columbus with them. But our team, and this was our construction team and our architects went down to Columbus along with our representatives from Columbus working with us to their own organization and made a case that the only way we could make this work was to allow us to do these things that were out of the box in terms of their standard operating procedures. So, maybe a little reluctantly, they turned the buildings over to us and left the abatement and demolition money with us to pay for the main construction. It then fell upon us to find what we were gonna do with those buildings. And we've been able to be pretty creative with that as well. We actually traded three of the buildings with the city for some property next to Northwood. We sold Northwood. We used two of the buildings, uh, Westwood and Crestwood, uh, because we had one of the VEs was to take the uh, preschool out of Northwood. And they had to go somewhere, but we had to take them out at the time because we had to build the building for all the other grade levels. And we've been able to now make a preschool center at Crestwood. So that saved us the money there of not having to demolish it and we reallocated that money to the construction to the tune of about $5 million. They also allowed us to use site safety money, which is $300,000 per school. Site safety means if you have a dangerous way that you have to enter a school building because it's on a busy highway or something like that, then there's a little extra money where uh, you, you might have to make a, another entrance, you may have to put some traffic lights in, you may have to have some signage and things like that. And we did have to do that in a couple of buildings because, uh, for example, Northwood on Abbey Road gets very busy. We had to make our own spur. But they allowed us to use the rest of that money for construction, which was great. And through a number of, of issues like that, we sort of picked and peeled our way. Uh, the city and the township were wonderful. Uh, we went to them and said, hey, I know you have your fees for construction. We're doing multiple millions of dollars worth of construction, which is a little unusual for both of those communities. How about we split and you charge us half of what you would ordinarily charge? And it was a $600,000 savings when they both said they would help us that way. Well, the... the Construction of the new school meant a lot to the township because that was a significant investment into the township, which we're very grateful for, but it also kind of capped off a remarkable year for the township because not only the school uh, construction started, 
but also the Carvana project started at the old uh, Spiegelberg Orchard project. So in its entire history, the township has never had that kind of construction investment in one year. And you know, it just is in excess of $50 million in one year is just incredible. When all these construction projects came into play, it kind of shone some light on our zoning fees and how uh, our zoning fees were structured because there were a little lot of line in regards to the size of these projects. They were fine for a small store remodel or something like that, but for a project this, with this type of significant investment, uh, those zoning fees are just way out of whack. So we took a good look at uh, how things were set up and talked with the schools. Uh, I've had a long history with Mr. Rigda, Paul Rigda, and have a very good working relationship with him. So we were able to come up with a figure that uh, fit the school's budget and something that we could work with there because we were basically, uh, we were just happy that the schools would maintain a presence in the township here, so, because that's important for our residents and for the west side, we felt. So, so Mr. Rigda reached out to Mayor Brenda at the time and had a conversation with her about what was the possibility of the reduction of plan, planning fees, which are the architectural fees that are charged to the city to send uh, those plans out to be reviewed to make sure they meet state codes, as well as the building permit fees, the fees that the contractors take out to do the actual work. And between Mr. Rigda and, and Mayor Brenda and Council President Lotko at the time, um, they had had a conversation about reducing the fees by 50%, uh, which was a huge um, uh, savings for the, for the district. And when I looked at the numbers, um, I, I realized that not counting what's going on at the sports complex right now, uh, counting the athletic, original athletic complex and the four buildings, uh, we were in a neighborhood of about $450,000 that was saved overall in building permit fees and planning fees. So that was $450,000 that the district as well as the city and city council collaborated with to make sure that there was additional dollars that could be found to continue the construction or to start the construction uh, of the buildings. Target was $18 million. We had to come up with one way or another. So through keeping buildings rather than abating them, reducing fees, using site safety money, uh, using the hardening money, uh, a lot of VE along the way, uh, good use from the Treasury Department of the money that we received from the bond issue, investing it and using the interest money, the LFI money, uh, all, of, all of that money together, essentially on budget. The greatest thing that I think came of all of that was, was the work on the team to make sure we didn't lessen the experience for students. That's first and foremost. So we, we kept any of the cuts away from their learning spaces. So, as, you know, as we finally sort of got a handle on the program and, and got ourselves back on, under control with the budget and started getting our buildings going and underway, and, and uh, then, then we've just had another great surprise, and, and that, of course, was the pandemic that, that everybody has suffered through. Who builds all these buildings at the same time you're going through a pandemic? Well, we started before the pandemic, obviously, but it was super challenging. Um, we were very focused on just making sure our families were okay. That was first and foremost. But also our construction families, they became kind of part of the team. So there were a lot of things we had to do, like providing nurses at check-ins of construction sites to make sure they were safe making sure that when the students were in the, in the buildings that construction um, workers um, were safe and tested and everything so that they weren't bringing any of the COVID pandemic issues into the buildings. We haven't had to date any money out of general fund that's used in any of the construction with one caveat, well, two caveats. I believe our superintendent's going to talk about the federal funding that helped us with the renovations. 
and a little bit of general fund that went into the renovations because we needed the space for the preschool. We needed some place for the board to operate out of because that administration building was prohibitively in need of, of too many repairs. And uh, that little bit of general fund there and some ESSER fund, that was it. For the main bond issue though, not a dime was asked of the public nor of the general fund and uh, the state either. All of it came out to where we can actually now even finish the stadium. During the pandemic, the federal government and the state government really helped out. And we actually got three different pots of money to simplify it. ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and the American Rescue Plan, ESSER dollars. What they enabled us to do was nothing short of a miracle, really. Um, I'm not sure we would have been able to do everything we did do with the building project because of how the economy changed. So the first ESSER we really just used to get through that first year, that March of 20, buses deliver food to our students and families and provide technology and learning plans for them. So that money was solely used for academics and really just family needs. Um, and then you roll into ESSER and ARP ESSER, American Rescue Plan ESSER, we call it ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. And the ESSER dollars were allowed to be able to be used for looking at filtration, air filtration, making it safer for students and families to be in the buildings and staff, um, but allowing us to buy new windows in some of the um, renovated spaces, allowing us to put in new doors and locks and safety measures. So. I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have been able to um, refurbish the old Crestwood into the new pre-K building to add on to the Westwood campus and using parts of the old Westwood um, because we needed that. Throughout all of this, many districts were losing students. We have not lost students. So we were able to get very creative in what we did and the ESSER dollars allowed us to do that. We all sat around the table. We all had one goal in mind, and that was to take the dollars that we had available and somehow come up with the five buildings and finish the project, starting with the high school, which they did before I was here, finish the project so that all the children, all the students in Elyria had new facilities to go to. I felt we were really good moving into new buildings as far as technology. I was always very proud of that. But we just carried it over and updated our old practices into the new buildings. So one of the things we did new was we used to hang smart boards on the wall and every summer we'd get a new teacher in a new classroom and we'd get a request to raise the board, lower the board. And so one of the things we did in the new buildings was put movable mounts on the board so they can use just a little remote control and it'll raise and lower the board exactly to their liking. Um, so because sometimes a young, like in a primary classroom, they might want it lower to the ground so that a student can write on the board, but then they want it higher so they can show a movie and the kids in the back of the class. So we started to think about all those types of things like what problems have we run into at our old schools that we can now correct. Gabriel and Michael look this way. Um, it has been a huge change uh, throughout the years. Uh, first teaching in my first year at Franklin Elementary School, and then at the O'Leary Kindergarten Village, and then Windsor Elementary School, and then now the New Northwood Elementary School. Um, each building has been special in their own way, um, but so many different changes throughout the year. Uh, coming to this new building and having the opportunity to have all new things has been really nice. Who doesn't like, like new things, you know? Um, the new building with the beautiful, bright, beautiful colors. Um, one of my favorite things about this building would be um, definitely having the orange brick road, is what we call for the kindergarten friends. Um, everything is color coded by grade levels. So because kindergarten is in the orange area, the children are able to follow the orange line all the way down the hallway and it leads them right to kindergarten. As the same thing for the other grade levels. 
Um, just the facility in itself being brand new, so many different opportunities for teaching with our new ELA areas. The children are able to go out in the hallways, have small group learning, um, small group singing, whatever we have that we want to do out there, we're able to do uh, in small groups and also together with other kindergarten classrooms, we're able to come together and work together as a group. Uh, they enjoy being here. Uh, I can see it every day in their faces. They come to school ready to learn, you know, and they're excited about being in this facility. One thing I noticed from being at Windsor Elementary School and now at Eastern Heights Middle School is my colleagues are right in our pod. Before I was down the hall, kind of near the, the gym, and now I'm upstairs immersed in their pod. So they see my students, I see them. Um, we can collaborate if we need to and do things like that. And they stop in my room. I'm like really a, a popular place up here. So I really like the change. I think the students are enjoying their space. They're able to navigate it pretty well, follow the colors to their lockers, um, be able to come and access their classroom pretty easily. So yeah, I believe they are enjoying it. For the voters that made this possible, I'm really proud that they took a risk, and took a chance and said, hey, this education in Elyria is amazing. And if you give us new buildings and new spaces, we're gonna really take education into the 21st century. Thank you. Say thank you so much for believing in our teachers. Thank you so much for believing in our students. Thank you so much for taking the time to say yes to our kids. I like to read a lot about history. And the first thing that pops up is a quote by Winston Churchill. He likes optimistic leaders. And those are the leaders that can find opportunity in every difficulty versus difficulty in every opportunity. And I think of every single difficulty we had, the core team was able to find opportunity. And I'm still amazed that we're able to really get the schools done for everything that we've had to go on through. I, I, I just, I'm speechless that we were able to get it done. I really am. I'd like to uh, thank the voters of the city of Elyria for having the trust in us um, to build these schools and uh, the new stadium. And uh, they really put a lot of faith in us. And I feel that the core team was able to, to get it done. I'd like to thank also, you know, Superintendents Jaman Slosh, Mr. Rigda, our consultant, all the educators for being so flexible here during this time, um, all the administrators, everybody that pulled together. Um, it was a huge team effort. Um, and, and the vision definitely came from the core team um, and Mr. Rigda, and uh, we are very grateful for, for all of them. They have this great campus setting uh, with the schools with Westwood and the remodeled uh, Crestwood. Uh, it just makes it great. It's just amazing how the buildings look and the kids love them. My grandson's in first grade here at Westwood and he absolutely loves the building. He's just having a great time with it. And he was fortunate to be in the first years of in the kindergarten class last year when the building opened up. So he'll be a part of the first class to go all the way through the new Westwood building once he graduates there, which he says he's getting older every day. So knowing in 2016 where we were as a district and where we are now as a district with new buildings, the, the pride that's there. My son was the was the, the first graduating class to graduate, you know, on the new football field. And I handed him his diploma on a field that I was a part of helping to bring to life. And there's a lot of partners that weren't a part of school board within the community that also made that happen. But just talking to community partners and the excitement that's there, I mean, you can go there on a Friday night, you can go there for a baseball game, and people just talk about what it was versus what it is now. The students that go uh, to these schools, you talk to their parents, and that just brings the excitement back uh, to know where we were in 16 and the struggles that we had and now we're getting to that completion as you just talked about and you can sit back and you don't take a, a deep breath but you just kind of think man really look, look what was accomplished when a lot of people worked together and collaborated to make sure that we did what was right for the residents and the children of our of our district so as i look back at you know and drive around and see these new buildings it is pretty amazing to see what we started five to seven years ago 
a, on a sheet of paper, an idea and a sketch and pointing out, oh, I like this, I like this. To see that vision in person is a great feeling. Um, it's definitely a great payoff and worth all the hard work to see how it turned out. Despite the financial challenges, despite building schools in the middle of a pandemic, to be a part of a team that was able to pull that off is a fantastic experience. These projects are really transformational in the in the life of a community. I mean, we're, we're creating spaces, we're creating opportunity, uh, new schools that uh, will happen once in, I don't know, 50, 60 years or so. So they're really trans transformational and that's the, the, the uh, fulfillment that we get, the accomplishment that we get uh, from these projects. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that I learned, and I know at times we talk about it a lot, uh, collaboration, collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, but what, how, what is it really, how does it work? And I'll tell you from the partnerships that we created or that were created and the relationships that we created allowed the core team to work together. We may have differences of opinion. We may have conflicts. We may have uh, issues that we don't necessarily agree on. But the idea is how do we keep the, uh, the core team functional? How do we uh, exchange ideas and uh, allow everybody in a safe environment to express their opinion and uh, work with each other? And I think that has been um, one of the greatest experiences and it doesn't always happen this way. Uh, the district was uh, there every every minute working through the issues, making decisions and moving forward. So you collect all of those together and it is really a proud moment and, and, and a proud moment for, for the Illyria community. And we've always said, you mentioned we work on so many projects at one time and that's true. But when we are with Illyria Schools, Illyria Schools is the most important project for us. And, and um, we, we want to make sure that we meet the district needs and we, we, we build the environment that the community is expecting. And, and that by itself, again, is a, is a, is a nice feel, nice feel. Yeah. Uh, to me, we, we've done a lot of projects in the end, it ends up being about people. You know, at the beginning of a project, we go through this thing about partnering uh, and, you know, a big part of that is learning to trust your teammates. And uh, we, I've been on projects where that has not happened. And that is, uh, it's not a fun experience. And you really, you don't really need to trust your, your partners too much if everything's going well, because there's no need to question anything. You just keep moving. But when you have the kind of challenges that we had at Illyria, uh, that's where that really proves itself. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of it, we were getting tested, you know. Uh, people were looking around, maybe trying to, you know, figure out who to blame. You know, was it over-designed? Is it overpriced? Did the state not give us enough money? I mean, everybody was looking. But then we realized, I think, that, you know, if we all do our part and come together, um, you know, we can pull this off may be painful but we can pull it off and that's exactly what happened i agree, I agree very much, much with what ramsey said and to me you know going through something like that gives me a lot of confidence on my next project um you know because we've been through it we know how to do it uh, and we can give hope you know so to speak to other districts and we're, we're continuing to do that and i do use O'Leary as an as an example you know when i went to kindergarten in O'Leary and I, I, we added on to Prospect Elementary and we were all excited. Oh, we have a new part of the building. We don't have to be in the portables anymore. And then I think, oh, then there's the high school. 12 years ago, we built a beautiful new high school and how proud the students are. If you walk through it right now, it looks as new as it did 12 years ago. And now this, there's just so much pride in what not only the community did for us, in, in Elyria and for the students and the families and the staff, but also all the work that the staff put into making sure it was the best possible learning environment for each family and each student. And sometimes I sit there and I wonder, how did we get this done during a pandemic? Um, but that's kudos to everyone working on the project. Not only Elyria staff, but also 
the architects, the construction managers, the subcontractors, and also our partners in the OFCC from the state, you know. They became part of the Pioneer family, all of them. And it really is a miracle what we did under the conditions that, that came to us that no one expected. So there's nothing but pride. This sounds like such a cliche, a true team effort. There were no members of the team that didn't want to be involved. The board stayed involved. They supported every one of these creative measures. Uh, the contractors, the, the CMR, the architects, the state, uh, the core team. And I'm referring to core, that's C-O-R-E. It's the core group of all those players we're talking about who meet on a regular basis. And that core team really came together as a team. And we had a pandemic to deal with. We had people who weren't coming to work. When the electrician gets COVID, it's not just the electrician with COVID that goes home. They were all exposed and they had to go in quarantine. So we had buildings with no electricians, no plumbers, no drywallers. And if you've ever done any construction, even a home construction, you realize you don't think about it when you buy your house, but it's done in sequence. Certain uh, companies, certain trades have to go in before the next trade can do their work. Well, when the trade's not there and they have to shift buildings, uh, it's just a tremendous amount of coordination and facilitation. And uh, to make it through that, it's, it was just incredible. At the height of the pandemic, we hadn't even been into Eastern Heights yet and Westwood. And we knew that the buildings had to be the same. You couldn't build the first three when you saw that you were making it happen. The pandemic hits and you can't then shortchange the next two. And we didn't. I don't care what building you go to, even the color scheme in the elementary buildings of what color you follow to get to the fourth grade is all the same. All the equipment is all the same. We're very proud of that. So it's a sense of pride, a real accomplishment, but I'll always be fond of this group who function totally as a team. No name calling, no blaming. It was just total cooperation.